when were you born? I was born in Woodville, Ontario, in Eldon Township, uh, in 1937, April the 3rd. Damn, you're a fool. My preteen years uh, involved the war years. Uh, I grew up, it was a, a Woodville, Ontario is a very small rural community. It's halfway between Beaverton and Lindsay, and um, very much influenced by what was going on. Most of my, all of my uncles were overseas. Uh, most of my family were dependent upon my grandfather, who was a farmer uh, uh, for food. Uh, when I say that, was for, for chickens and, and, and uh, uh, pork and, and cattle. Um, I was uh, taken out of school to help on the farm uh, on a regular basis because there, no, there were no men to help. And when I was in grade probably five, six, somewhere in there, I went every May early to help on the farm because uh, it was needed. I learned to drive horses. Uh, I learned to how to, how to farm and to assist, and I'd often hire out to uh, other farmers because I could uh, assist that way. Um, wh what, I, what I remember about those years uh, was the tragedy when in our little community um, we would receive a telegram. Uh, and those of us who had bicycles would go early as we could get out of school and go down to the railway station to get telegrams because we got a, a, a nickel for delivering them. But the telegrams were often very sad because somebody's son had been killed overseas. Uh, I remember the railroad that came through town. We'll talk about that a little later because it always came from Midland. Um, and uh, the, the length of the, of the railway cars uh, stretched for miles and miles with the loads of grain on them. Uh, I remember the hobos that tramped through the country who were uh, either too old uh, to be in the army or avoiding the army, and uh, uh, there the was just sad to see those men. They just lived from place to place. Um, I remember the good times, the family times, uh, Christmas times, the snowstorms that often kept us at Grandpa and Grandma's because they didn't plow roads in those days. You had to wait for, for things to happen. Uh, I remember going with uh, my grandfather uh, to political rallies. He was a great fan of one of our uh, Premier, Premier of Ontario, uh, Leslie Frost, who came from Lindsay, Ontario, and going to those rallies uh, up at uh, Long Beach Ranch uh, on Balsam Lake. And uh, Mr. Frost would get under a tree, and he'd have shade, and the rest of us would sit out around in a semicircle and listen to him for hours talk about the political situation in Ontario and Canada. Some of my memories. I arrived on my 13th birthday, the third day of April, 1950. We, we moved to town. Um, we left Woodville with all our possessions very early in the day, and it was very late in the day before we could uh, unload because the uh, moving van that came was too large uh, to go through the Port McNichol trestle. You know, that you see that opening that's on the side? Uh, uh, of the highway when you're going towards Victoria Harbor. It was too big to go through there. So they had to try and go around a concession road and it got very stuck on the concession road. They had to get farmers with horses to pull it and it was late in the day before our things ever arrived. So uh, it, it was quite an experience. It was cold and wet and damp. I remember that. Very, I was 13 years old that day. For me, uh, a, a young lad, born and raised in farm country, pristine country, to move to Midland and to hear the sounds, to smell the smells, to, to see the light um, was astounding. Because my first experience, um, if you know where, if you remember uh, where we live, was on the corner of Midland Avenue and Elizabeth Street. Uh, it's our family funeral home there. We were on the third floor, and we were exposed to everything that was going on, and Midland was an entirely different community at that time. I talk about the smells. There was an acrid smell of, of burning metal, which came from the shipyard. They were building ships there at that time. 
uh, and uh, they would be passing uh, hot rivets or welding and that permeated there. There was the smoke from uh, the steamships that came in and out and, and they were coal fired. So most of the lower part of the bay hung coal smoke all day long and there was also the dust from the grain elevators uh, which uh, permeated the air and it was just something so foreign to anything that I had ever experienced in my life. One other sound that I remember very vividly, because of the lights at the shipyard, because they worked 24 hours a day, was bright. And there was a, a small hawk. Oh, it couldn't have been much wingspan much larger than that. But he would screech out of the air at night for bugs, and you'd hear them come down. We called them screech hawks. Uh, I, don't, I, I haven't seen one or heard of one here. But they would screech out. You'd hear the riveting going on at the shipyard all night long. You'd hear the screech of the screech hawk. And then there was a, uh, from the edge of the shipyard all the way down to William Street along the waterfront were the coal docks. And they, may, they worked around the clock when the necessary, uh, the ships were always fueled with coal. And uh, the big crane that moved back and forth, taking the coal from the coal yard, putting it on the ships or taking it off the ships, it screeched all night long. It's an entirely different community. Hmm. <laughs> well, as I told you a little bit about when we were farming and then when, uh, when we came here, this is the biggest body of water that I'd ever seen in my life. Lake Simcoe, a little bit of it, but, but uh, then it had the experience of Georgian Bay. Uh, the ships coming in and out. Uh, I fell in love with, with Georgian Bay and, and, and all, so happy that it's been a part of our lives ever since we arrived here. Thinking in terms of the experience, one of the greatest I ever had was when I was uh, 14 years old, I got a job as a, as a coal passer on the city of Dover, which was a passenger ship that went up the shore as far as, as uh, uh, Go Home Bay uh, t in the summertime, took supplies to all the cottagers, uh, it uh, took mail, it had a regular mail charter, and uh, we were hired on t early in the spring. Uh, to help prepare the ships, paint them, and get them. There were two ships in the, in the Georgian Bay navigation, the city of Dover and the Midland City. And they would usually winter either in Penetang or in Midland, and we would go early and help paint them. Um, high school, I was never a very good student, but I loved being in cadets. We had cadets, and I uh, was very proud to participate in the cadets. And then other summer jobs uh, that I had, after um, I had an opportunity to work on the city of Dover, became a coal passer and, and a wheelsman, I, uh, uh, we would have on a regular basis a superintendent uh, f uh, for national parks, and we would take him to Bosley Island. And I kept pestering and pestering him for a job. I got a summer job working on Bosley Island, 1955, 56, 57, and uh, learned how to Georgian Bay waters in a government boat, so you didn't worry too much about dinging a propeller or uh, uh, hitting the odd shoal when it was a government boat. Well, to be a part of this community, volunteerism uh, it, it just seemed to be a way of life. I, I remember uh, uh, my, my community for, for, for the, the town, I was on the Harbor Committee, uh, I was on the Board of Park Management and Arena Commission, uh, very proud to be a member of the Rotary Club. The Rotary Club, uh, we started Community Living Huronia. In those days it was called uh, Huronia Association for Retarded Children. Uh, been belonged to the Anglers and Hunters. Uh, belonged to uh, our church and the church uh, associations that we have there. Some great family experiences. The Old Midland Shipyard was one of the most unique uh, engineering features that I've ever known in my life. Um, if you can imagine, the greatest, biggest ships built on the Great Lakes, uh, b as they prepared for the seaway to open, they knew they were going to be able to use bigger ships. And um, to, to see the, the way they side-launched off that shipyard, uh, the, the, those big, beautiful big ships 
Um, they would be uh, put in there by people who understand engineering far more than I would, but they took out the blocks in the sequence so that when the final blocks released, the ship came into the water. The great thing to be was to get invited on a friend's boat, and when that wave came across the bay towards you, to ride that boat up on the great big wave and go down. That was, that was really an experience. The shipyard, working night and day, uh, the lights, uh, the noises, uh, the, uh, the association with the people who were involved down there, because they were all uh, very professional people. It was a skilled, skilled trade. It's gone from our community forever. But it was a, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, it's too bad it left. It's one of those things that happened in our community. That The Midland Coal Dock f functioned for years and years and years because we were the bottom of Georgian Bay. All the ships that rocked the grain from, uh, from the head of the lake, uh, then called Port Arthur and Fort William, uh, would coal up at both ends uh, because it took a lot of coal to keep those uh, ships going. They also supplied coal to be taken away by, by train uh, to various parts of Ontario and, Can uh, and Canada. Um, local consumption. Everybody burned coal in those days and, and so uh, there was a lot of coal came from there. Uh, there was different grades of coal and kinds of coal. It's a study in itself uh, right down to Stoker coal which uh, we used in, in our, the building that we had. Um, uh, j just uh, about the coal and, and, and as that whole life situation turned um, many, many jobs lost because they were de very dependent on that. Uh, the people that work on the coal yard, to see those huge mounds uh, across there, and there's been nothing there. Well, I shouldn't say there's nothing there. There was salt there for some years, but that was moved to Perry Sound, and then, uh, the salt piles are in Perry Sound. Huge, big mounds of coal. What happened to the railroad system that was popular in the Well, the railway system had, had uh, two primary functions. One was, was for, for the industry to move the grain and the coal, um, and I, I made reference to that earlier. Uh, the the uh, grain trains would stretch from here to Victoria Harbor sometimes. They were so huge. Uh, all of the grain that went to uh, the ocean came here, was loaded onto railway cars, and taken down into Quebec to the various... So. Uh, there was a whole society built around that. People worked in the elevator, people worked on the trains. Um, an interesting uh, feature was the engines when they come in. And if you go up William Street, where the ball diamond is on William Street, and you go to just below there, there was a round table. And when the engines came in, they had to be turned around to be taken back out. So there was a great big round table turned in there. It used to be fascinating as kids to go up there and see them turn those great big engines around. Um, the trains... Uh, I remember them because they used to switch just above Woodville, Ontario, and when they had to go e east, they went uh, east at Lornville. Uh, they would, you could walk on them. As kids, we could walk on them for miles. Um, what happened was when they opened up the seaway, uh, the seaway, the, the big uh, lakers could, uh, or uh, ocean-going uh, ships could come in all from anywhere in the world, go to the lakehead, and um, load up themselves. The little we, uh, what we used to call canaler ships that were, were, were uh, just uh, could only get down so far um, because of, uh, uh, of the canals being so small. The canalers disappeared because the big ships took over. Uh, the grain, um, the exports, we used to export through Canada, through Midland, Ontario, grain all over the world. Since then, we've given, given, been give, giving most countries uh, the ability to grow their own grain. I remember um, in, in the 60s going to Spain on a trip and seeing miles and miles of olive orchards. And today, it's all grain farms. We just came back from a trip on the Danube and, and we toured uh, uh, Hungary, Romania, Serbia. And they're growing grain for miles and miles, enough to take care of practically the entire European common market. So our exports are getting smaller. And grain is not as what it, what it used to be. And that's what happened to the railroads here. Too bad. But passenger and freight was also a big part of it. When I first came to Midland in April of 1950, I went back and forth to school 
in Woodville to finish my year on the train. We could, we, we could go, and we'd go to Toronto on the train. You never thought about getting in a car because it was a long old ride. You'd go to the, and, uh, and take the train. Well, I, I think an in, in, in explanation to that was uh, when the when the ocean going ships uh, could go to the head of the lake and uh, load up and go right back out again. Um, there was no need for us to have elevators. The only elevator we have left is the townhouse, uh, and it is uh, used for uh, flour uh, that is made for cake and pastries. Pillsbury, we have Pillsbury here. We have Ogilvy, and uh, it's a softer Ontario wheat. The Western wheat doesn't come through here anymore. Okay, I, I have to, uh, I have to tell you uh, how I learned about the Zamboni ice maker. Um, didn't know much about Zamboni ice makers or or, or anything like that. Um, you'd see them on television, and they were kind of a, a unique thing. Um, and um, I was on the Midland Board of, of Park Management uh, and Arena Commission, and I was. I think at the time treasurer, and I saw come into our, our uh, financial statement uh, a large sum of money. And when I'm saying large, it might have been in those days twenty-five, maybe thirty thousand uh, dollars. Excited because uh, trying to operate the parks and the arena uh, was very expensive, and we had to do it from income. The town didn't give us very much money. We were badly in need of, of equipment and things, and I saw this lump sum of money. So I went down to see. Uh, the clerk treasurer of the town of Midland, Mr. Bill Hack, and I asked him, I said, Bill, this money, where, where does it come from? Is it ours to use? And he said, no. Uh, he said, that's from the Zamboni lawsuit. And uh, I said, well, you know, the Zamboni lawsuit, I, uh, I never heard of this. What is it? He said, well, I, ha I don't have the time today to tell you, but you ask your friend Doug, Doug Haig, who was uh, the town lawyer, uh, and I was uh, curling with Doug Haig at the time, and we would be on long trips all over Ontario. And I asked him one time, Doug, what about Zamboni? And he said, well, that was a lawsuit, and the town lawyers weren't very much involved. But what happened was we had a very uh, energetic and, and, and imaginative uh, arena manager and uh, parks superintendent by the name of Harold Mac McAllen. And Mac uh, ran the parks and the arena on a shoestring and his in ingenuity in making things and doing it. He went to Brantford, Ontario, with one of our hockey teams, and he saw a Zamboni. And, and he, he looked at the piece of equipment, he studied it out, and it was on a tractor, and it lifted the ice uh, the, between periods in the hockey game and recycled it through propane boilers that were on this machine. And he said, I, I, can, I can do one of those. So he came home and he made one. Uh, and it was used for, for some little time until uh, they were, uh, the town of Midland, uh, Board of, of uh, um, Arena Commission, was issued a lawsuit by the Zamboni Company for uh, infringement of patents. And uh, it went to court uh, in Toronto and Midland lost. And the Zamboni people, as I understand the story, the Zamboni people said to the town of Midland, we want you to take this to the Ontario Court of Appeals. And I think that's what it was called at that time. It may have been the Ontario Superior Court. I'm not too sure. I think it was the Court of Appeals. And I th the understanding was that Zamboni would reimburse the town for anything that, was lo that, they, that they lost. We, we lost the Court of Appeal. And what monies came into my budget at that time was monies that Zamboni paid the town of Midland for taking that lawsuit all the way through to the Court of Appeal. Yeah, there, there, was, uh, there was a benefit and there was a loss. There was a benefit for Zamboni because they protected their patents. 
So they went on and are the company we see today and the modifications. The original old Zamboni was, and I have some information here if you're interested, and Frank Zamboni was a Utah farmer that ended up in California and, and, and ended up running an arena and decided there was a better way to, to, to make ice and conserve water. Uh, and uh, uh, that tightened it up so that it's really the only ice maker that's available uh, in any arena, even as today. Uh, the loss to the town of Midland uh, had to be a personal one because, because we were kids. There was a society in our arena called the Scoopers and Sweepers. And we uh, were involved on a rotating business, and there was a good number of us, to be prepared to attend any hockey game or any event that took place because we would have to sweep along the boards between periods or during the figure skating between uh, the changeovers there sweep along the boards, put the ice out away so that you could run by with a scooper and take it out. It was shoved into hoppers on the side of the, uh, of the arena uh, and melted. And uh, w that society of scoopers and sweepers, we had a lot of privileges in the arena. Never had to pay to enter. Uh, every Sunday we would uh, uh, have free ice time because in those days Sunday was a closed day. You couldn't, you couldn't uh, r be in the arena rented or anything. We were required to uh, assist in, in uh, shaving the ice down, and it was a great big long uh, metal uh, bar with a sharp edge. We used to put cor uh, curling stones on top of it for the weight, uh, because if you understand how ice is, the thinner the ice you can have, uh, the better of ice you're going to have, because it comes right off the, uh, uh, the cooling system. And uh, we would shave the ice down, flood it, then we could play hockey all afternoon or do whatever as long as we cleaned it up the night before we left. We all lost our jobs when the Zamboni come because it shaves and cleans and it returns the ice, uh, it returns the water to the ice. So uh, we, we lost it. The only thing they kept us around for for some time was the, both the Midland Arena and the curling rink. The one ice plant in, in the Midland or old Midland Arena supplied uh, refrigerant for both the curling club and the uh, arena and uh, both of them had um, the pipes were just in sand so in, as soon as as the season was over we were required to assist in bringing out great big huge chunks of flooring that were put down they were all interlocking and marked and we put them down that we could roller skate on them uh, in the, in the summertime and there were f uh, fall fairs and things that used the inside of the arena for that so we basically lost our our, our privileged jobs as scoopers and sweepers My legacy in Midland. Uh, well, I, I, I would hope that, that it, if I have done anything in Midland, that it made it a better place for people to live and, and enjoy through the volunteerism and, and uh, the things that I have done. Society, society is changing, and, and, and to, uh, for, for youth today, you have to look honestly and, and hard. I think even far harder than we did because there were, there were all kinds of jobs that were open and there was an open society. Uh, my advice today would be uh, to get a good schooling, but not go uh, into a direction of schooling that doesn't leave you with some... Uh, functionability. It's all right to be well educated, but to have a practical experience, to, to, to be a mechanic, to be a, uh, a nurse, to be a school teacher, to be a, a person of, of, of interest in all the things that, that happen. Uh, I used to say when I was hiring students, say, you know, what experience have you had? Well, I haven't worked at it. I'd like to hire somebody that had worked at McDonald's or put things on the store shelves at, at Canadian Tire or one of the grocery stores because you learn to work to a system. You, 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 you're not single stand alone and, and, and you, you learn very quickly. If you learn to work to a system, you can work to anybody's system. You're very adaptable. Um, many of the students that would come to me and, and uh, promising great, great marks in school but couldn't work in a system that, I, that I'd want. As young people, we worked 
uh, in, in, uh, in the old Loblaw store that was in town. Our manager, Mr. Bill Howard, uh, he, he was uh, very strict that we had to, everything had to be done to assist him. And that's my best advice. Work someplace in your part-time jobs where you can learn to work to assist them. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. I hope that I touched on everything. If you want to want to see a 15-year-old, uh, everyone was required to have a seaman's card. You had to have that on you know, all the time you were on a ship because if you fell overboard, that's the only way they had a, a, of identifying your body. It, it w that was the first I'd ever seen of a plastic card. Had to become uh, a, a seaman, inter international seaman. And uh, the fingerprint on the back of it. Uh, Started as a coal passer on the boat. Dean, I'd like to ask you about uh, your business, if, if you don't mind, how, you, how you got into the, I guess the. Okay, yeah. Uh, how that came to be, because you came to Midland and that seems like. Well, yeah, my father, uh, uh, our funeral home on Midland Avenue was the first funeral home in town. Funeral homes prior to that had been in the back of furniture stores because if you're furniture, you, you, you either built or man manufactured your own or you bought from somebody else and had a supply of caskets. Uh, the business just previous to us, two years before we uh, was b uh, bought away from the, funeral, uh, from the furniture uh, business and uh, uh, by a young man by the name of Oakley Doolittle and uh, he died very young of cancer. My father uh, had uh, been working in Woodville in a casket manufacturing plant uh, got out of that and uh, had bought a general store, wasn't happy at that, was looking for a funeral business. He was licensed uh, as a funeral director, a uh, bomber and funeral director. And this one came up in Midland. Midland was a bustling town. We were a service area uh, close to Midland then. It was about 17,000, uh, what it is approximately today, but was a much smaller community. And it was one that he could afford to buy. Um, when when we uh, when we arrived in town, uh, it was a very small business. Uh, it has grown. What got my father in the funeral business? My father was born and raised on the farm, but he had a severe allergy to dust and grain dust or anything that happened, or hay dust or anything. Like that. So he'd gone to work in uh, in uh, Toronto at Goodyear uh, Rubber Company. Uh, his his uh, company offered incentives for people who could figure out how the production line could be moved uh, a little faster, a little better, and modifications. And he came up with one, and he got a real big bonus, enough for him to, in those days to be able to buy a car. And that was uh, pre-war years, in the, but the Depression. He was able to buy a car. Only the company modified his modification, and he got laid off. And he went back to Woodville and started to work for this casket manufacturing company and, and fu funeral. And so the, he got his license the year I was born. Uh, that brought us to Midland with that. And I worked with him until 1973 when I bought the business from him. Uh, we uh, operate that business and I operated the Penetanguishing Funeral Home for 15 years too. Mm -hmm. There are probably, I'm sorry, there are probably lots of things that, that uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> probably lots of things that I, I, uh, I didn't mention. Uh, the, 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 the ships that would be here, the, the, you know, the small canalers, if you go out there and look at the, it was a whole different way of life. I'd sit, we'd, I'd sit in school uh, in March, when most of, by mid-March, most of the ships would start to get their boilers heated up and get ready to leave. Uh, once they got everything moving smoothly, one of the things that they had to do was make sure their whistles were working because that was very, very important to the operation of the ship. Well, we'd sit in school and we could hear, our school was the old uh, Parkview, you know, and that was a high school at that time, and uh, you'd sit in school and the whistles would be going, and 
uh, you'd go out for recess and you'd look when you come back and this guy was gone. Uh, and, and, and that would happen on a regular basis. This guy was gone. There. Because those ships carried probably a minimum of 15, maybe a maximum of 25 or 30 people. Uh, and, and there were all kinds of jobs available. And it, it, it was, in those days, big pay. And uh, that lure uh, to, to, uh, to hear those whistles and know, you know, they'd be looking for men or boys or whoever would want to go. To, to, and you could get a job just like that, practically. And, and so uh, it would be nothing to lose five, six, seven guys every spring. <laughs> they wouldn't finish their school year because of the... And uh, the, it, it was a, an entirely different economy because all of those ships, at one time, you could almost walk right across the bay with, with, the, with the ships, the little ships that were in here uh, on the top of them in the wintertime. Um, it, it, the... the all of those ships had to be supplied with food, uh, with all the necessities they needed when they were offshore. It, w it all came from Midland. There were all kinds of stores. There was Midland uh, frosted, frosted Foods uh, run by the Russell family. There was Preston's store, uh, Dominion store. Um, all, uh, all kinds of suppliers. Ruby's Bakery. This was before my time, but they did a lot of the baking for the ships to take on board. Well, all of that is lost to our community forever. Um, it, it was it was just a different way of life, and of course, uh, up and down the street, every street in town, if you go and look at the historical records, had a captain uh, living on them or a chief engineer. They're very important people in our society in those times because uh, they made they made uh, some pretty good money. They had uh, some very, you know, had to, had to have a lot of knowledge because they didn't have the radar or the technology to run a ship today. The one that I was on on the Danube uh, this last uh, three weeks, when it when it came down. And it, it wanted to go to the wall to tie up. Uh, the captain sort of stood out on the side of the ship. He's got a propeller that turns 180 degrees, two of them, and a bow thruster. And he just moved the ship sideways in. Well, we had tugs here that had to help ships move in loaded with grain. Uh, sometimes if the water was low, it was very tough to do because Midland uh, was at one time just a swamp. And, and uh, it... Uh, uh, was was uh, 21 feet was the, was the best. Some of those ships that come in would be pretty close to uh, 21 feet. That's that's another thing I'll tell you about uh, that in my memories of associated with my business. I often wondered why when you go up Little Lake Park Road up towards uh, uh, Young Street, why St. Margaret's Cemetery is so much lower off the street and St. Mark's and all the way. And I used to live at the end of Young Street. And it's all subsoil. Well, Midland was a swamp. And that was a long way out of town at one time. And in everybody's front yard, most of the downtown part of Midland, was all that they dragged from there down to fill yards and, and fill the, uh, fill the, uh, the, the in so that they could uh, make the town solid. Mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, another thing that, that I remember uh, in, the, in the Midland scene it, it was after we arrived, but um, Bourgeois Motors on the opposite corner uh, is the Bell Telephone Building. You know, you know where that one is there? Well, uh, we were only in town maybe a year, and they started to build that building. Well, they couldn't find a bottom. They drove piles there night and day for weeks and weeks. And I remember when I was trying to study, so I guess it would be for my grade 10 exam, 52, 53, somewhere in there, they pound all night long and try to study with that thump, thump, thump. And we were only a block away from it. The whole, everything shook and trembled. It, it's now gone, uh, but where, where the new art center is going, if you ever sort of look from uh, King Street uh, east on, on Elizabeth Street, the building went like that. Well, the, the contractor who built that building went bankrupt trying to find a, pl a bottom on the, on the uh, northeast corner. Uh, it, 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 it was just bottomless. They pounded piles. They did everything they could. And, and he went bankrupt, uh, a man by the name of Boshaw. And uh, Boshaw had a construction company here. Uh, they moved the building, this new one they're building, in from that one corner a little bit because uh, of, the, uh, of the type of no footing there. I can remember on... The, uh, most of the stores downtown, uh, the, uh, Hartman's Hardware was on the, um, uh, oh, what's over there? Just up from the Bank of Commerce, 
a few doors. They had an open spring ran in there. People used to go in and get honey pails full of water. It was the best water. Down at the town dock where Midland Boat Works was, there was a spring down there. People came from all over Ontario uh, to get water out of the spring that came out of there because Midland, that waterfront, was just swamp, springs, and muck. <coughs> Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's why the, the, rock, the rock sea was kind of... Yeah, kitty cornered on one corner. Yeah, yeah. The, nor the, the northwest and uh, the northeast corner was ran out like this. The yeah. building went out to get it. I never noticed it's yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah. And that was because bottomless underneath. I, <coughs> I was on the harbor committee we, uh, this quite a few years ago, and there was a, a ship, big ship, one of the big grain ships came in, and it, because of wind or something, they couldn't get in to... Uh, to tie up so they dropped an anchor and they never did get that anchor back it went into muck and just just kept going they had divers going down looking trying to find where it dropped through but uh, it, it's a big swamp it was a big swamp that's why in in the war or during the war of 1812 um, uh, Penetang was chosen as the ideal harbor because it's narrow and you could put fire a cannon they had across. So if the Americans were going to invade uh, and were going to try and get in so they could get to Toronto, they had to come by Penetang because that was where the road was. The, the British knew that they could defend that particular place, but, but Midland Harbor in those days was just a big swamp. Mm -hmm. And Port McNichol was, um, uh, there was just too much granite. They had to dig so much out down there to, to let, and, and that, was, that was something else too that, Midland was mainly a CNR town, Canadian National Railway, and Port Mionicle was a Canadian Pacific town. Mm -hmm. The boats, the boats yeah. made a big difference, yeah. They yeah. had yeah. great summer jobs on the Kewatin and the Assiniboine. Now there's talk of the Kewatin coming back. What do you think of that? I think it's a good idea. It's a, it'd be wonderful. There was a lot of, I never got to work on those boats. I was always working.